talk with you about why I preach Christ. Really, it's why I preach Christ is all. First of all, He is all my righteousness and my justification. He is all my redemption and all my forgiveness. He is all my light and all my life. He is all my hope and all my rest. Spiritually speaking, He is my all in all. The name Christ, or the title Christ, appears in 555 verses in the New Testament. The name, or the title Christ, is transliterated from the Greek word Christos. And Christos means the anointed one. It's the one whom God anointed to, to uh, save his people to bring deliverance to his people, to justify his people, to, to redeem his people, to bring his people to peace with him. Jesus one time asked his disciples, Whom say ye that I am? Who do the people rather say that I am? And so they said, Well, some say that you're John the Baptist, and others say that you are Elijah, or others say that you're one of the old prophets that's come back to dead from the dead. And then he said, Well, whom do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, according to the gospel, according to Luke, You are the Christ of God. You are the anointed one. You are the one set aside to be our deliverance. This is a subject that we could spend almost an unlimited amount of time. I'm going to limit the things I say to you to ten. And so... Ten things, and I have about 30 minutes, about two or three minutes apiece is all I have to talk about these things. I want to give you ten reasons that I preach Christ. First of all, I preach Christ because He is God in the flesh. It is not a mistake that the first book of the Bible begins saying, In the beginning God. And the last series of books that are written in the New Testament began saying, in the beginning was the Word. Because the God of the book of Genesis and the God in the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, He's the same God. We're talking about the one God and He is God in the flesh. Isaiah said, behold, in Isaiah it says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. That is quoted in the first chapter of Matthew concerning Christ as the fulfillment of that particular text. In John, uh, John's Gospel, it is recorded that when, when the Lord Jesus came into the midst of his disciples after they had, uh, he had resurrected from the grave, that Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. So the first reason that I have for preaching Christ is He is God in the flesh. The second reason that I would say to you that I preach Christ is because He fulfilled Old Testament titles and offices. For example, the office of the prophet. In Luke chapter 1 and 76, the that was said to him, Thou child, thou shalt be called the prophet of the highest. And there are other places, but that's just one place. But he also was a priest. He was a priest, it tells us, after the order of Melchizedek was prophesied in Psalm 110 and verse 4. And then that is, that is fulfilled and quoted in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 17. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, but he not only was a prophet and a priest, but he was also king. When he came riding into Jerusalem upon the back of the donkey, it tells us in John 12 and 13 that they said, Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So he was prophet and priest and king. But he also had various titles that concerned him. For example, Isaiah says that his name is Wonderful and Counselor and the Mighty God and the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. 
Isaiah 9 and 6. And in Song of Solomon, in the second chapter in verse 1, he said of himself, I am the rose of Sharon, and I am the lily of the valley. He is the most beautiful of all the landscape. But he also, according to Jeremiah, is the Lord our righteousness. In Malachi, he is the messenger of the covenant, and he is the son of righteousness. So I preach him because he fulfilled the Old Testament titles and offices. No man has ever done that. No man could ever do that. So I preach Christ because he's God in the flesh, because he fulfilled Old Testament titles and offices. And number three, I preach Christ because he fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. We have an Old Testament prophecy to begin the uh, the series of prophecies in Genesis chapter 3, it refers to the seed of the woman. And then it refers to the seed of the serpent. And then two times it uses the word bruise, bruising his head and bruising his heel. The heel of the seed of the woman would be bruised and the head of the serpent would be bruised. When you read that, you don't know exactly what he's talking about, but you know that violence is in the future. You know that there is going to be some type of violence that is going to take place. There is a conflict that is coming. Well, that prophecy of this conflict and of this bruising all took place in the Lord Jesus Christ in His body and His soul upon the cross. So there is a prophecy that could only have been fulfilled in and by Him. Jacob said in prophecy in Genesis 49 in verse 10, talking about until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. Well, Shiloh is the man of peace, and that man of peace is, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Shiloh. I would say to you that he is Moses' manna in the book of Exodus. He is also the peace offering in Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 1. In the book of Job, he is Job's daysman or intercessor, and he also is Job's ransom in chapter 33. When you come to the Psalms, he's David's shepherd in Psalm 23, but he's also the king of glory who entered into the, uh, to the right hand of the Father in Psalm 24. In the book of Proverbs, he is Solomon's wisdom. In Isaiah 53, he is his suffering servant. He is Jeremiah's righteous branch. In the book of Daniel, he is the Ancient of Days. In Zechariah, he is the Wall of Fire. So all throughout the Old Testament, there are prophecies that concern him, and he fulfilled those prophecies. He fulfilled them, and he set them aside. Here's the fourth thing, that I, the reason that I preach Christ, and that is that Christ fulfilled Old Testament types. There are no more types. He is the last of the fulfillment of the types. The church is the bride of Christ, but he is the type. We're not a type of him. He fulfilled the type, and we are his bride. He died for us. But I would say to you that he's Noah's Ark. That deliverance that came from the great worldwide flood in that ark is a picture of Christ. He's Moses' tabernacle. When in, you come to the Gospel of John, it says that he tabernacled among us. So that tabernacle in the Old Testament that is traveling about is the place of worship is a picture of him. He is the place of worship. He's Moses' smitten rock from which the water came. He's Joshua's rock that is called Ebenezer that we sing of sometime. He's Israel's refuge that we sang of and that we read about rather in the first hour in Psalm 14. He is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In the book of Daniel, he is the redeemer in the book of Hosea. He is the plumb line in the book of Amos. All throughout the Old Testament, you have these pictures and these types. He is the fulfillment of those. There are no more. I would say to you, number five, that I preach Christ because he is God's propitiation. Now we're getting serious. He is God's propitiation. Christ Jesus, whom God set forth, to be, it says, a propitiation. Literally, it says, whom God set forth a propitiation, or to be propitious. It's 
kind of a hard thing to understand. But that pro idea of propitiation has to do with satisfaction. You see, God had to do something for himself before or in conjunction with doing something for his people. He had to be satisfied. His justice had to be satisfied. His wrath had to be turned away. There could be no righteousness brought in until God the Father was fully propitiated. And so in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 it says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous or the righteous one, and he is the propitiation of our sins. The propitiation was the bloody sacrifice. That bloody sacrifice laid out on the altar and it was there that God was satisfied. Throughout the Old Testament in that, uh, that picture of the altar, there he is. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, it says that the apostles were also assured and they preached him as a man approved of God. So I say to you that everything about Christ, God was approved of. Of. And he approved of that propitiation. He approved of that satisfaction of justice. God the Father was so infinitely satisfied that he sovereignly caused his attribute of justice and his work as justifier to meet together. They kissed. That that seems like a small thing to you and to me, but God is a God of justice and he demands, he demands judgment upon every sin, every single sin. We cannot count them. They're so large. They're so full of everything we do. But he calls his attribute of justice and his work as justifier, which he was thoroughly committed to, from before the foundation of the world. It's for that reason that he made man, to prove himself the God of grace and the God who justifies. He did that in Christ Jesus. There and then, it was so complete that he justified his people because he could require no more. So I preach Christ because all of his justice could require no more. That, that was a perfect propitiation and nothing else could be required. But not only number five is Christ God's propitiation, but I preach Christ because he is the sinner's substitute. These two go together, him propitiating God and him being the sinner's substitute. In the book of Genesis it speaks of Abraham and of Isaac. And when he was about to kill Isaac, this is what it says. It says that Abraham offered him up for a burnt offering, the animal. He's talking about the ram that's been caught. He caught him up and he offered this ram in the stead of his son, in the place of his son. So he took that ram and he took that knife and he split the throat of that ram because God always requires the most precious thing that man has and that is blood and he offered that ram in the place and in the stead of his son there is a picture of substitution it tells us in the book of Leviticus just at the very beginning of this book that Abraham shall place his hand upon the head of the burnt offering so we'll take this animal place his hand upon the burnt offering, the head of that burnt offering, and then it says, it shall be accepted for him. That is substitution. What he's telling us by that picture is that the only way we can possibly be saved is by a substitute. We cannot pray enough. We cannot give enough. We cannot work enough. We cannot be sincere enough. There had to be a substitute. So here's what Peter said. He said, For Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might, or that he might upon a just ground and in a 
effectual way bring us to God. But the only way that it could be done was that he died the just for the unjust. Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 5 and 2. Christ has also loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. So we know, we know who gave, that was Christ. We know how he gave, he gave as an offering and a sacrifice. And we know to whom he gave, he gave to God. So Christ gave himself to God on the altar as the bloody sacrifice in order for there to be a full and complete salvation by substitution. Paul is discussing the church in Ephesians 5, and he said that Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He gave himself for her as the substitute. So there are three things that we know about the substitution. The substitution was definite. It was for the elect. We know that the substitution was complete. He bore sins to their exhaustion. The expression is as far as the east is from the west. And he was a substitute in a saving way, delivering from guilt and from condemnation. So I preach Christ because he was the substitute and grace could require no more. Grace could require no more because he is the only condition for both propitiation to satisfy God and for grace which was needed by the sinner. He is the condition only for that in that way. And by this propitiation and by this substitution, he did what both the psalmist said and what Daniel said, and he brought in righteousness. He said that he came to fulfill righteousness, meaning that he fulfilled it and brought it in. He did that by the propitiation, and he did that by his work as the substitute. Here's the seventh reason that I preach Christ. I preach Christ because he is the realm of salvation. What do I mean by that? Because the Bible uses the expression continually in Christ. For example, in Ephesians 1 and 4, we're chosen in Christ. That means in connection with, in association with, in conjunction with his glorious person and his finished work in the realm of Christ. And the scripture says in Romans 8 and verse 1, there is no condemnation in Christ. It tells us in Colossians 1, in Corinthians rather, 1 and 2, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. There's no sanctification outside of Christ. All the sanctification is in Christ. And we don't work to be sanctified. We're sanctified by declaration, just as we were justified by declaration. Another place it tells us, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Where is that life? It's in the realm of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 19, it says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not outside of Christ, but in him. In Galatians 3 and 28, it says, Jew, Greek, bond, free, male, female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean that we have diff don't have different roles in life. We certainly do. But it means that God views his people, male or female, bond or free, rich or poor, equally one because we are in the realm of salvation by Christ. Here's the eighth reason I preach Christ. I preach Christ because he finished salvation at the cross. We studied a couple of weeks ago where in Colossians 2 and verse 16, he nailed my sin to the cross. He took a hammer, he took a nail, he took my sin, and he nailed it to the cross. We also know that he finished the faith by enduring the cross. 
in Hebrews 12 and verse 2. We know that on the cross he completed his obedience unto death, Philippians 2 and verse 8. We know according to Colossians 1 and verse 20 on the cross, he earned my peace. We know that according to Hebrews 10 and verse 9, that he established righteousness and the covenant of grace. We know according to what Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, and what Paul said in Galatians 3 and 13, that he became the redeemer of his people from the curse of the law. We know according to Hebrews 9 and verse 17, that he became the testator of the covenant. What do I mean by that? That means that the one who willed had a will to be opened up. But the will is not active until the person who is the testator of the will dies. He had to die in order for the terms of the will to be opened up. It was decreed that there would be a full justification, but there had to be the death of the testator for there to be a justification, a reconciliation, or a remission of sin. But then we see, not long after that, in verse 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, but the implication is that with the shedding of blood, there is the remission of sin. I preached Christ because he finished salvation at the cross. He became the testator of the covenant. He shed his blood to remit sin. He died the Lord of glory, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 and 8. And Christ and his cross, I say with Paul, is all my glory. I have nothing else to glory in. What would it be? Nothing else to glory in except Christ. But I preach that the Christ of the cross finished the salvation there because he himself said, right at the end of his suffering unto death, tetelestai. It is finished. What did he mean it is finished? He means all of this that we're talking about is finished. All of the salvation is finished. But I also preach Christ because of his relationship to the church. He's her foundation in 1 Corinthians 3 and 11. He's her Passover in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. He's her altar, according to Hebrews 13 and 10. He's her head, according to Ephesians 1 and 22. He's her love of God. We love him because he loved us, 1 John 4 and 19. He's our resurrection, according to John 11 and 25. That's what he said, I'm the resurrection. He's a quickening spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. He's her gift from God, according to 2 Corinthians 9 and 15, he's her hope of glory. Paul said in Colossians 1 and 25. He's her savior according to Ephesians 5 and 23. He's her surety, Hebrews 9 and 24. He's her apostle and high priest of our profession, Hebrews 3 and 1. He's her wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. He's her rock in the wilderness, I know that. Because in 1 Corinthians 10 and 4, it says that rock was Christ. He's also her rock of offense, according to 1 Peter 2 and 8. He's her hidden manna and morning star, according to Revelation 2. He's her faithful and true witness, according to Revelation 3 and 14. And I come to the final one. I've said to you, Christ, I preach Christ because he is God in the flesh. He fulfilled Old Testament titles. He fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. He fulfilled Old Testament types. He's God's propitiation. He's the sinner's substitute. He's the realm of salvation. He is salvation. He finished salvation by his cross. I preach him because of his relationship to the church. And finally, I preach Christ because he is the centerpiece of gospel preaching. In the book of, the, of the Isaiah, chapter 61, in verse 1, repeated again in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. And in Luke, Mark chapter 16, in verse 15, he said to his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel 
to every creature. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and 17, Christ sent me not to baptize. In other words, I'm not a number counter, but to preach the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, For I am determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul said in Romans, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to them that are at Rome also. He said at the very last chapter that he wrote in 2 Timothy 4 and 2, Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. I think we ought to preach him as the friend of sinners. That's what it says of him in Matthew 1 and 19. I think we ought to preach him as the Lamb of God. That's what John the Baptist said about him. We ought to preach him as Abraham's faith. That's where Abraham looked, according to John 8 and 56. We ought to preach him as the great I am. That's what he said. He said, I am before Abraham was. John 8, 58. We ought to preach Him as the sovereign creator. That's what Paul said in Colossians 1 and 16. We must preach Him as the faithful witness, the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 1, 5 and 8. We must preach Him as the good shepherd who gave His life for His sheep. We must preach Him because in Him there are, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us, according to Romans 8 and 37. And we must preach Him because, as Peter said, Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. Where else would we look? What else would we preach? What else could possibly be our message? May we at Providence Church never veer, never find another step away from preaching Christ is all. He is all. He is everything. May we preach His everlasting righteousness, which He brought in by His suffering unto death, which God accepted and God reckoned to the account of His people for their justification unto life, to take us out of death and unto life. Sometimes we sing a little hymn, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, my cornerstone, this solid ground. It's number nine. In our folders, we're going to sing verse 1 and 2, In Christ Alone. Let's stand together. Mm -hmm. 